Without further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Maria Konomi to join us on stage. Welcome, Maria. Is it open? Yeah. Okay. So, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be here at last. This is my first trip abroad after COVID. So thank you, PQ people. So I've never done like a five minutes, so I worked out a method. So these nice people would just play some visual material back and I, I will just give you some inf very quick information here and hopefully I can elaborate if you have any further questions. So um, I'm a new member of the theater department of the University of Athens. I'm both a practicing designer and a researcher and also a member of the collective curatorial team of Greece. I'm here to talk super briefly about a project from a team, which I follow, uh, I follow the work and I also have collaborated with both as practitioner and as a scholar. Uh, the team is Odyssey Assembly. And um, I will be tackling some questions like, how did we uh, face the COVID challenges? How can we still connect in a common shared space despite physical isolation and how did digital technologies come into play, transforming familiar forms of everyday lived experience and everyday digital tools to a generative domain for the performative arts. So I will show you quickly a proposal from Greece, which is not inventing new technologies, but is just manipulating pre-existing found technologies, uh, namely Zoom. So this project, Traces of, of Antigone, foregrounded issues of performance liveliness and audience participation in connection with an imaginative use of the new, te new technological means. And in this discussion, I will also introduce the Greek concept of Agora, uh, which is a concept quite close to the Roman Forum, and more specifically, an Agora of the digital realm, Zoom, as a virtual and hybrid Agora. Agora is a spatial form and concept originating in ancient Greece that manifests a particularly rich and resilient form of public shared space with multiple and overlapping uses, as Agora was the locational, functional, and symbolic center of the city and the cultural, political, administrative, legislative, religious, and commercial public life in the city of classical Athens. Agoras can also be envisioned as strong performative spaces, opening common space to participation and reclaiming the citizens' spatial and political agency. So Traces of Antigone featured a digital virtual version of this notion of an empowering public space with Zoom being used as an online production and performance space amidst the COVID-19 pandemic in May, October 2020. And it's still playing today as a hybrid format pre uh, presented both to online and to uh, live physical live audiences. So Odyssey Ensemble and director El Papa Costantino uh, have this multimedia performance theater company. They're more and more into the new media um, uh, current. Uh, and uh, the, the project was based actually on the contemporary feminist adaptation of the Antigone myth by the Swedish Greek playwright, Christina Uzunidis. It featured a digital online chorus of six female performers, as well as further participatory strategies for the audience participants. The women narrated and performed fragments from the play storyline, touch, touching also upon personal things and experiences of female angst, oppression, and violence, especially while growing up. Following Antigone's model of political revolt, Uzunidis and Papakostadino take the all female, female cast out of their imposed frustration and seclusion to the digital public sphere by forcing their individual enclosures and making the voices public. It created a strong parallel of the female oppression with the COVID predicament at the time, and also was a very strong, uh, like prophetic also like project as the Greek Me Too movement was gaining momentum in the, in the end of, uh, by the end of 2020. The Greek, uh, the creative use of the telestage and screen scenography were focal elements, along with the use of video art and multimedia aesthetics. The project expanded the functional conventions of Zoom um, it, to include telematic live performance and telematic live of audience with almost no pre-recorded material as shared content. Uh, the project foregrounded instead multiple live narratives 
and the more or less synchronous digital manipulation of the spatial and visual frames of light performance. The project overcomes the either or mode, either live performance, uh, performers, Windows content producing or participants as a receiver windows by introducing a participatory dramaturgy of merging the two at multiple levels. For example, there is a breakout rooms navigation se section for each member of the audience to choose and follow on their own with different narrative threads and different visual material presented. More importantly, at the core of the project lies the Agora section where the audience is asked directly to open their cameras so they become both eyewitnesses and participants to the act of the digital performance and also they become the visual and conceptual uh, content themselves. Uh, as well as they also uh, become ear witnesses to the conversation debating Antigone's fate, which takes place against the background sound of a real public protest. Ultimately, at this point, we ourselves as audience, we are confronted with questions about our online, offline stance to such matters, violence to women, political protests, and so on, the politics of the digital uh, sphere. Traces of Antigone also involved a version of a hybrid Agora, apart from the live stream performance. It was presented also as a mixed live and online performance with both physical and remote audiences in the Roma Europa, Europa Theatre, and now it's coming also in Athens at the moment, in May. Turning Zoom as virtual and hybrid Agora, Antigone's digital traces exemplify an important online offline trajectory of contemporary critical feminist thought and a resilient form of performance. It was a performance itself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria. And now I'm going to invite uh, Marina Malani. Hi, everyone. I'm a theater communications and uh, person and here start my five minutes. Thank you, PQ, for this. It's wonderful. Okay, let's see. So cosmos is a word borrowed from the Greeks, used in many languages to define the universe, the environment of a species, or a system of thought. Webster Dictionary actually defines it as an orderly, harmonious, systematic universe. Interestingly, the word in Greek is a noun derived from the word kosmo, it's a verb. Kosmo means to adorn, to decorate, to make ornate. In modern Greek, cosmos is used in many other contexts as well. It refers mainly to a crowd of people, as in the phrase, the crowds gathered, or as people, plainly in the phrase, are the people seated, or even as the word for audience in the theater. Ah, the direct translation of that is another interesting word in Greek, kino, which means common. Audience means common in Greek. And um, cosmos also is used in its diminutive form, kosmagis, even to mean the people of no power, the simple people of society. In using the word cosmos in modern Greek, the adornment aspect of it is almost completely disregarded, but the connection is there. People adorn the theater. People are the jewel of any performance, wherever that is held. They complete our cosmos of the theater and design space and all its elements which should be respected for their own value. Back to cosmos, it's a phrase we use to announce the restart of theaters in um, 2020, July 9th, 2020. O cosmos tifesidu is a phrase that actually means the people back in its place. It also means the world returns. It also carries the connotation of cosmos. The beauty comes back in position as people take their seats in theater. Um, I skipped my video actually, I think. No, this is eating up my five minutes. Let's see. I don't know why. Um, perhaps this is because, yeah. Try it from the current slide, perhaps, not from the beginning. Okay. 
yeah, it uh, worked perfectly when I tried it. I don't know if something changed during. No. Uh, do you have it in, in, in the file? Separately? It doesn't matter. Let's go on. It's um, just okay. give me back what I had so I can. No, just the slideshow, not this, the one I had prepared. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Um, excuse me. Well, we try again. What happened in and during, hopefully after the pandemic, was amongst uh, um, other all the horrible things that uh, that happened, an amazing opportunity for all of us to realize that this amazing art of scenography became an essential life art, spilled off the stage and into the world. We had to scenograph the cosmos we lived in to fit in the credible script of the pandemic rules in order for all to feel and be safe, or so to speak. While the concept of scenography evolved and started to take new meanings and captured new spaces, both physically and virtually, before the pandemic, as COVID struck, disrupting every normality as we knew it, the confinement acted as a deciding force in making us take a new look at the field once more. Which brings me to the second point, and I think you're not watching what I'm, I don't know, what, what did you do to my presentation, sorry. <laughs> I mean, it was rehearsed and played. Yeah, but you're not seeing what I'm changing. So, yeah. okay, well, we'll try once more and see what, sorry about this. Well, March 2020, we went to lockdown. Uh, that is when we started to work as scenographers for the public space, really. We had to read the play, the COVID decrees, over and over to understand how we could adjust entrances, exits, and movement within the space for all players, on stage, backstage, in the audience. Even on the streets, as the police showed up to disperse the crowds, we had to create the universe, the cosmos, for each and every one of those areas. We came up with solutions and suggestions for the people making the rules at the Ministry of Health, scenographing solutions for movement of bodies and arrangements of space that were all adopted and became part of the official government decrees. Scenography and its mindset gave us the solutions every time, which brings me to the third mention of the presentation. Recently in Cyprus, the Cyprus Center of Scenographers, Theatre Architects and Technicians hosted a symposium under the title Performance Design Futures. It was an amazing three days with extraordinary people of the field from all over the world sharing views and work on how they see the future of performance design. We talked about the fact that the world has become an array of designed environments in which performances by humans unfold, as Dorita ha Hanna pointed. Along with the ideas of expanded scenography and Tanya Beer's eco scenography, taking into consideration that everything is alive and can potentially affect us positively or negatively, urging designers to think ecologically, holistically, and with respect and allowing representation to all live elements, le vivant. Rachel Hunt's criminal scenographies and Andreas Scortis's need for freedom met with the anthropocentric views of the looted ghost city of Famagusta and how to respect and revisit history by our newly appointed Deputy Ministry of Culture, Yanis Dumaziz. And so how does scenographing all environments in the new sense tie in with the cosmos? I believe the spillover of scenography off the stage and the views expressed on the future of performance design both go back to the essentials. People who love and care deeply about something, refuse to go without it, are determined to work at it, with it, for it, and will do everything possible to forward it. And all has to do with the realization that our cosmos comes from Cosmo, respecting everything that adorn it, Le Vivant. No reference to the play in the slide. I just love the slide. Theater is about making people 
realize things and about caring. We are in this art to prepare environments for people to thrive in. Where are we? We, we are where we need to care for each other and our world. War and destruction has no place in our cosmos if it claims to be civilized. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina. Thank you. And next up is Sarah Brown. Welcome, Sarah Brown. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. While we're getting the slide presentation up, I'll just say my name is Sarah Brown, and I'm an assistant professor at MIT in set design uh, in the Department of Music and Theater Arts. Oh, here we go. Great. Um, so thank you so much for inviting me to talk about The Other Shore. It is a virtual reality dance performance that was uh, produced by the art company uh, Zoe Juniper. You can go to the next slide. Where are we? Was the question that I was asking with this core team of collaborators in March of 2020 when our work began. And where we were, uh, were was alone and we were afraid and we were desperately missing the work that we had dedicated our lives to. And I don't think I need to go on about that because I feel certain that many of us in this room were in that same territory. And we can go to the next. Um, we had been planning to develop a new iteration of a dance performance called Always Now that featured two rooms with unique audience configurations. As it became clear that we would not be creating a live experience, we turned our attention to developing a new piece for a remote audience based on that two, same two room structure. And our inquiry was largely the same. We asked how can a remote audience encounter a dancer, not just as an objectified body, but as an individual with their own stories, identities, and agency? How can we create a sense of intimacy with audiences and performers divided by time and space? We were all living in different US cities and, uh, and we would meet weekly by Zoom and our work continued through the darkest days of the pandemic the racial justice uprisings in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and the storming of the US Capitol. Uh, the worlds we were making became a reflection of where we were, fractured, broken, and dark. Exploding, eroding, and falling. But the content of the dance became more and more personal and intimate. The tension between the state of our world and our yearning for connection became foundational to the piece. Uh, as a set designer, the move from actual space to virtual space was at once disorienting and freeing. Untethered by the reality of Euclidean space, uh, I created this drawing to express how I saw these two rooms related to one another. They were mirror images of another, one another sharing a ground plane. You can go to the next. Um, in May of 2021, we gathered at the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art to film our performances. And the environments are shown here superimposed in the uh, sort of psychic arrangement that I imagined them in. Um, in this room, which we called the solo room, each dancer developed movement uh, with choreographer Zoe Schofield inspired by the story of their birth. The movement in the ensemble room showed dancers catching and holding one another amid a space falling towards entropy. Video designer and co-director Juniper Shui captured the dance via a 360 video camera that moved along the Z axis through the center of each room. By putting the audience's eye in the center, we removed the gravity of an external viewpoint. To get this performance to an audience, we sent every, uh, and this was produced by Jacob's Pillow, um, we sent every audience member a box that served as a portal to the performance through links to audio and visual content. Um, audience members were encouraged to uh, explore it at their own pace and return to it as they choose. And in this way, the box is a performance that can live on your shelf. 
uh, and it lives on my shelf. Uh, and to prepare for this talk, I rewatched the performance uh, with fresh eyes. Um, and what I was struck by was that how your physical body really starts to disappear when you put on the headset. Uh, you look down and see only the floor where you should be standing. Your position is fixed, but you are free to look around the entire space as you would in a live performance. The experience is intimate and immediate. The dancers make eye contact, and actually, can we move to the next? Here we go. Um, the dancers make eye contact with you and walk through you. At times, they loom above you, and at others, they seem to shrink to miniature. The ensemble room, uh, this disembodied feeling is further amplified by the way the perspective changes. You are lying on the floor with your headset, your VR headset, looking up, but your perspective is from above looking down at the dancers. This perspective, perspective then flips, and you feel as though the world has orbited around you. So where are we? The title, The Other Shore, suggests aspiration, not destination. For me, making this piece gave us an opportunity to explore new methods and strategies, to learn from what was in front of us rather than wish it was some other way, to continue towards that other shore, swimming side by side through turbulent waters to keep from getting lost at sea. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sarah. And now we're uh, switching into the online part of the uh, of our presentations. And first up is Aziza Kadiri. Hello, everyone. Um, I wonder if you can see me. Um, yes, we can see you. Okay, hi. hi. Um, <laughs> my name is Aziza. It's, uh, thank you for having me. I am a performance artist uh, and mixed reality designer currently based in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Um, let me just start my presentation real quick. Um, so I'm also representing Immerse Lab today, which is an international collective that experiments with merging live performance and digital experiences, and particularly experiences that are mobile-based um, in augmented reality. Um, before I start saying anything, I want to elaborate that I've been working in Russia for the past year and a half. I strongly condemn the war in Ukraine, and I wholeheartedly support all the fellow Ukrainian artists that may be present today as a decolonial artist that has been working with underserved ethnic communities in the post-Soviet region, I am really devastated that the futures of so many people have been stolen by this senseless war. And I ask you to understand that the work I will be showing today was created last year and is uh, critical of the processes in Russia. And I've also expanded my presentation to include some examples on activism in augmented reality. So um, moving on, uh, our collective focuses on the site-specific aspects of augmented reality performances, creating interactive mobile scenography where the audience is able to experience familiar spaces in a completely new way. In our AR shows, the narrative often asks the viewer to shift their attention between the real world and the liminal space of the augmented world. And through this, we hope to generate previously unseen meanings. We also explored the possibility of giving people agency to generate their own digital environments through very accessible AR tools. And to illustrate the idea of AR sonography, I want to show you one of our most recent examples, an AR experience called the Museum of Moscow's Subconscious. Um, it's an experience that prefaced a massive theater production of Solaris by Stanislav Lem. Um, the project was a critique of the colonial nature of Moscow and its disastrous dependency on crude oil and energy export. Uh, its narrative depended on elaborate world building and the communication between the physical real world anchor, anchors, which are paintings with fantastic lore, and the AR elements uh, in the layer hidden and the hidden layer between the physical and the digital, so the digital. This approach allowed for interesting interactions and impromptu performances by the audience as they interacted with something that was both invisible and present on the digital layer. Uh, we also focus on social and urban activism using mixed reality technologies. 
Being from a state with now very obvious limitations on the freedom of expression, I view AR as a revolutionary platform for marginalized voices. Um, its accessibility and highly adaptable immersive nature help reduce barriers and create opportunities for underserved communities. So this is a sort of an unclaimed space. Um, it's still harder to control due to its novelty. It enables anonymized and safe protesting and creation or recreation of impossible performance environments. Um, one of the recent examples is the Urban X series, where X stands for a uh, name of a city. Um, these air performances, uh, they highlight the street art communities in Russian cities that push back against propaganda, they fight conformism, and we hope these AR performances are also seen as tactical urban activism. We're looking to highlight regional artists and extend the lives of their artworks, also allowing the viewer to interact with art and be immersed in a story specific to each city. And it is particularly important now as street art has become one of the main forms of resistance in Russia and many artists we worked with, for example, Kirill Kto, are being prosecuted or jailed for anti-war artworks. Uh, the viewer can choose to either travel through the city and discover the places where the street art used to be before it was destroyed, for example, um, or watch the performance in a safe environment comfortably from home. And this way, the show that was created during the pandemic um, was more accessible for those who couldn't travel due to uh, COVID restrictions or due to their own personal disabilities. Um, I also organize AR workshops for the youth and people with migrant backgrounds where they create spaces and narratives for themselves in familiar environments using augmented reality. Um, this is one of the latest examples, uh, an AR workshop for a migrant youth in the shopping mall, which is a liminal space mostly visited by migrants from Central Asia and the Caucasus region. Um, and it, during the workshop, uh, the teenagers and kids, they could uh, sort of create their own uh, uh, scenographies and reclaim the sterile space and make it their own. So we're having issues with the uh, uh, connection. Of course, it must have happened. Let's let's give it a second. Is she gone? Sorry, sorry. I just disappeared for a second. Um, so yeah. Anyway, uh, I was just finishing um, and. Hang on. Yeah, so feminist decolonial tactics. And if you have any questions, feel free to message me on Instagram or ask anything during the QA. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aziza. Thank you. Thank you very much. And next up on our program is Tessa Rickson. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, I'll just go over and get um, a screen sharing started there. So hello, I'm joining you from Brisbane, Australia. I'm a lecturer in stenography at the Queensland University of Technology. And I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where QT stands, and where I join you from, the home and the land of the Yagara and Turrbal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, created in uh, December of 2020 by practitioner researchers in Brisbane, Australia, the Guest House was a performance project um, in which we investigated the interaction between dance, physical and virtual environments, spatial sound design, real-time motion capture and audience interactivity. Our aim was to create a relationship between these diverse systems to produce an intimate performance work that could offer safe face-to-face -face connection in the midst of an almost total shutdown of theatre in Australia. As sonographer for all bar the oral elements of the project, I was experimenting with how traditional theatre sonography can merge with extended reality spatial design. 
Based on the poem of the same name by Russian per, um, poet Rumi, this work, The Guest House, explored the pandemic themes of isolation, connection and loneliness by intimately connecting people with and through technology. Reactive digital avatars, animated photogrammetry, responsive projection mapping work together to shape a personal shared experience between two human beings. This iteration of the guest house invited a single audience member to be within physical and virtual space while wearing a HoloLens, the feed of which you're now watching, which unfortunately has knocked down the quality of the AR a little bit, apologies. Uh, a single dancer wearing a mobile perception neuron mocap suit manipulated the visual and oral uh, environments of both the audience HoloLens and the surrounding space. And the project's aesthetic was inspired by derelict spaces, family dwellings in disrepair and interstitial spaces such as alleyways. The two figures moved through an environment laid with projection, lighting and augmented reality assets seen only through the HoloLens. This included 3D objects from real derelict locations captured by photogrammetry. By engaging with the dancer, the audience member um, developed a shared movement language and learned to explore and manipulate the virtual environment. The dancer acted as guide for the audience member using movement to both facilitate audience experience and manipulate the virtual environment. So a projection design within the guest house responded to bodies via infrared cameras, as well as live motion tracking data from the mocap suit into Isadora, which allowed the dancer's movement to manipulate video content. This involved a new kind of virtual 3D spatial thinking for me to consider as designer mapping the space that the dancers, digital avatars and AR objects inhabited over the real space of the studio. Meanwhile, uh, three-dimensional spatial sound also played between the closeness of the HoloLens speakers and the surround sound of the studio. My main outcome was to find a balance and symbiosis between the various layers of visual media and physical sonography. And the role of traditional design, lighting, hung fabrics, became to support, frame, establish a world and introduce the audience prior to immersion in the virtual and then to bring them back out again. This was to establish the space as something other than a black box. The digital avatars and 3D objects were designed in collaboration with the physical sonography, then laid into the space via the audience HoloLens. And it was a delicate art of balancing the projection and lighting with the AR. We experimented with fabric choice, color balancing and writing intensities across both light and HoloLens content throughout. And I sourced and created video content from the same objects and locations that informed the AR objects. The virtual access to the space became mine to do with as I wished with projected content and lighting, while we kept all projection and as much lighting as possible off the floor to ensure the AR elements could be interpreted. This created a clean balance between the design layers. Um, through all of this, I've developed a set of lighting design parameters around intensity, color palettes and positions, which has served me well when balancing conventional and LED lighting with IR cameras and AR goggles. Only LEDs were used throughout the work. Conventional lights contrasted the IR readings and these LEDs were angled high sides at quite low intensity. We found um, direct overhead lighting, not an angle, started to interfere with the glass of the HoloLens itself, breaking the illusion of the AR objects laid over space. And I'm continuing to evolve these guidelines as my design work in XR performance grows and hope to distribute them when complete. Overall, the, the guest house ran over two days and invited 15 people to experience the short 10 minute work. And this prototype has helped us understand how XR technology and traditional spatial design can combine to create a shared performance experience. Designing the scenographic environment for an extended reality work like this offered a chance to understand how these two design forms can speak to each other and create a new hybrid layered sonography. And it's my hope that our work can inform XR works like this that celebrate proximity and shared encounters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tessa, as well. And next is speaking Eleanor Field. Hello, let me start my video. Hello everyone, right, let me just share my screen. Um, so I'm a designer based in the UK and I'm doing a PhD at Northumbria University in mess and scenographic processes. Um, and I want to talk about a production that I've been working on for a long time now that we had to turn into a digital theater piece during the pandemic. 
can everyone see my presentation and hear me okay? Is it all good? Yes, we can see you and hear you. Thanks. Thanks. Love it. Um, so I've been working with Caroline Horton on this production, All of Me, since June 2016. Um, I've been working on it as a designer in the rehearsal room from day one before Caroline had any, any text written or idea of what form the show might take. Um, the show explores Caroline's ongoing journey um, existing with disordered eating and depression. And because of the subject matter, we made the show slowly. We had intense periods of working in the room together, followed by weeks, sometimes months, working distantly and remotely. And during that time, um, I would communicate ooh, um, via sketchbook only and images. Caroline was working on a lot of text and with a lot of research and wanted as little word count from me as possible. And we enjoyed the fact that this allowed misinterpretation into our process really early on. Um, and we were able to kind of see where that led. Um, the show was, has been crafted through a purposeful creation of mess. Our goal was for nothing to look intentional and for everything to look uncomfortable. I was a designer working on a show that we didn't want to look designed. We understood that as literary professor Catherine Powell puts it, Mess is a somewhat embarrassing and often uncomfortable, emotionally complex gesture. And it's a show where Caroline warns early on, I apologize for not being at my best, for not offering you my best self. It is all just too tiring and absurd. The show has happened in this way because I am tired in a lot of ways, mostly of tidying myself up and hiding stuff like the frequent sensation of not wanting to be alive. The mess on stage um, is an archive of tried ideas, tested moments, failed costume and bits of story, all edited out, but clumsily. Um, they all impacted on the final version of the show and they demanded that kind of presence on stage. When forced to abandon the live tour back in 2020, we struggled to think about how it could be um, put out into the world digitally. Capturing, it, capturing the sonography of it felt really awkward and Caroline didn't feel like a streamed version of the show was right. It tidied it up too much. So we set about finding a way to share it. And we, so we swapped rehearsal room for Zoom meetings. This was like a, a kind of messy creative session that we had on Zoom. And we found that an embrace of Rosa Menkman's Glitch Studies Manifesto helped us find that way into a digital platform that would work. And we settled on a Twine version. Twine is a click through storytelling platform that allows soundscape and illustrations and it's immersive and it's meant to be used with headphones. And it can be as messy and convoluted as, as the kind of creator wishes. And we use within this, we found as Rosa Menkman says, that the glitch tells us something. It's a little breakdown, a twinge. It is a problem that arises in the system, but it might help us read that system and it can convey authenticity. And for us, the glitch created that unpredictable energy of Caroline on stage in the live show, where in the live show, she warns early on that she may have to leave the stage and that she may not be able to complete the show. So for us in the Twine version, the glitch kept the audience on their toes and kept them alert and guessing. We were also interested in Rosa Menkman's point about these fingerprints of imperfection and be that being visible in a digital version of the show and how the glitch reveals the truth of the experience that you are in. So um, these fingerprints that are often seen as negative and sometimes even as accidents, um, she chooses to emphasize the positive consequences of these imperfections by showing the new opportunities that they facilitate. So in our Twine version, it's really hard to screen grab a glitch, I discovered, um, but this is a screen grab of the Twine version where as the audience work through it, they're clicking about drinking and drinking and the text is getting blurrier and blurrier and blurrier. And Rosa Menkman again talks 
she has this brilliant quote about the equilibrium of, of finding the kind of perfect balance of this. So artists that work with the glitch processes are therefore often hunting for the fragile equilibrium. They search for the point when a new form is born from the blazed ashes of its precursor. We wanted to find a version where the glitching said something and did a lot, but didn't push the audience away and make the piece unreadable. Um, and we wanted to find a space where though the audience have the mouse and have the control over the story they're telling, they don't feel in control. They don't feel kind of safe in that space. The glitch throws them. We kind of wanted to think about it as though the audience are being haunted by a glitch, um, almost like in a seance, that kind of extra presence and, and that stress connected to those breakdowns in communication that we've kind of experienced in this session right now when glitches happen in digital communication, that, that adrenaline rush of, are we going to get back through? Are we going to hear through that glitch? So the, though the audience have the mouse, they don't feel safely in, con in control. And that was what the glitch offered to us in All of Me, which can be investigated online. Um, it still exists and the live version of the show is still touring um, and will be touring around Europe, hopefully in the later part of the year. So do look out for it. Um, but yeah, we go. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Alana. Thank you. And next is Klaus Kruse Ikeren Clarke. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Kieran Clark. I'm a core member of the Living Structures Theatre Company, and this is Klaus Kruse, our artistic director. We're also lecturers and researchers in the theatre department of Falmouth University, um, playing in virtual performance spaces. And today we want to give you an insight into Varian VR, which is our virtual theatre space developed with support from the Story Futures Train the Trainer program, uh, the Southwest Creative Technology Network, and theatre and performance students here at Falmouth University. Um, this video also gives a sense of the virtual space, its affordances to theatre makers and audiences, and hopefully its potential for further development. Um, and I'll just share the screen. Can everyone see that okay? The immersive and interactive virtual playground we have created engages audiences in new and exciting theatre formats that allow performers and audiences to interact in real time within this virtual environment. Whilst primary audiences experience the space wearing VR headsets, secondary audiences are able to view a live stream of the event via a computer or any other suitable screen-based device. Imagine It is but a puff of smoke. The theatrical set consists of 16 interconnected panels that surround the audience. Each of the panels functions as a video screen that can play back pre-recorded footage or live streamed video. The live stream function allows audiences and performers to communicate with one another in real time. The audience is also able to speak to one another directly in the shared space. As soon as we focus on you, that already helps. Come closer. Yes. I want you to confess your sins to me. The video panels are not only the medium through which audiences and performers get to communicate with one another, they also function as sonographic and architectural building blocks of our virtual theatre space. They can be realigned through the performance, adding uh, a kinetic element to the experience that alters and transforms the volume and the geometrical shape of the environment. Several of these VR spaces can be operated in parallel. This means different activities can go on simultaneously in the various spaces and are to be experienced by individual audience members at different times. My child, my child. I see you have come to confess your sins. The system of interconnected video screens and its multitude of functions are controlled by a stage manager via a digital control panel. Selectively, functions can be controlled by the audience themselves. For instance, if this is assigned by the stage manager, a spectator can start a video to play, set a spatial transformation uh, in motion, or teleport to another environment when they touch 
a specific screen. The design of Varian VR is based on a real life contraption also conceived by living structures. In this instance, spectators are enveloped within a scaffolding structure that is physically moved by performers as they are positioned on the outside. Spectators on the inside experience the environment as it moves and morphs around them. A 360 degree projection is mapped onto the surrounding screens, generating an environment of light, shadow, images, pattern and color, accompanied by a multi-directional soundscape. The physical contraction has a shared aesthetic and common concept of functionality with the virtual reality space that we have created. As well as further developing our VR tool, a next step for us will be to combine these two experiences into a singular performance. Uh, so we hope we managed to give an impression of the project with that short video. Um, there's so much that we could talk about in terms of the challenges and opportunities that arose and how we facilitated this collaboration between game designers and theatre makers, but there isn't time for that here, sadly. Um, the one thing that I think is worth mentioning is um, how theatrical that virtual performance space is. Although the world we've created is generated with a games engine, it's um, been designed by immersive theatre makers and being an audience in Varian VR subsequently feels much more like participating in a theatre event than playing a computer game. Um, we are really sadly we're unable to um, join the Q&A um, but I'm just going to put our email addresses in the chat. Um, if you have any more questions for us or want to explore this territory more um, please do reach out to us via our email addresses. We put them in the chat um, but if you can't see them uh, because you are live in Prague then um, please, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure our email addresses might be available somewhere. They should be available on the Falmouth website. And thank you to everyone who's presented so far. It's been fascinating. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation, Klaus and Kieran. Yes, the website is available on the program. And if you want to contact them, uh, for sure, let us know and we're going to put you through. But uh, next on is uh, Thea, Thea Hoffman Axtelm. Hi everyone. Um, I will. I'm Thea Hoffman Axtem, and I will share. I'm a Germany-based stage designer, and last since last year, I've been working on an artistic PhD at Eifelbeck University of Fine Arts in Hamburg. Um, and the current title of my research there uh, that I will share some insights about with you guys is how can stage design be reimagined for the digital stage. For my project, that probably will be a graphic essay about stage design. I try to state the basic functions of stage design in the classic theater situation, only to apply this knowledge to the fact that theaters, as many other artistic institutions, have been trying to move their artistic practices to the online space in the last years, as you all know. In some cases, this might have been a temporary emergency solution, but in new, some cases, new interesting hybrid art forms are about to emerge as we were already able to hear in the symposium. I want to investigate on how stage design as an art form very closely tied to a shared life experience can grow from the challenges appearing with new perception as the online world as art and theater space. Questions are how, uh, which know-how do stage designers have that help them think, build and realize performances in online spaces? How can they use the experience in live and co-presence performance to help create an interesting immediacy also in the digital sphere? And what new technologies and artistic practices do they have to learn or to participate in new developments that could enrich their jobs, still profiting from the talents? And how can we say, and can we say that we are once again at an artistic turning point where new technical solutions enable us to develop new ways of doing something very old, play theater? So for my project, I will look into how has stage design been used until now, then show a historical perspective and show that theater has always been influenced by technology, which in turn has been influenced by the social, economic and political reality of the time. And then show what is new right now, what designed digital spaces are emerging for technical, aesthetic and social reasons due to the acceleration of media processes within two or three years of crisis with changed production conditions. I will focus in, on German theater here. And now I will share with you some drawings in German, I'm sorry, that will probably be the base of my graphic essay about stage design that my artistic PhD will be. But uh, I will lead you through in English, of course. So, um, Opa. 
Do you see this uh, drawing right now? Yes, we can see it. I will not really dive into all of this, but you can see here um, two drawings of stage designs, um, just to show that I, I, just, I understand stage design in the sense of a shared reality that exists for the duration of a live meeting in one place, making the stage design the third player in an arrangement between actors on one and spectators on the other side. And then 2020, 21 comes along and the traditional theater plays in 3D and with it, the concept of the stage space with social political function is abandoned for let's say something like two years. And I looked into where did the stages go from there? What state did stage designers do? What new variety has been created? And what do we take back from this experience into the good old 3D space? Also in terms of documentation and new working tools. So I tried to map um, what experiments have been done and what possibilities artists found to do theater in the online sphere. This is a short look uh, into my mapping. I will not dive into this. I concentrated on German theater experiments as due to the state funding of theater in Germany, a legitimation crisis was added to the pandemic crisis, making continuing to produce art also political necessity. So there was online theater in the sense of performing in a new space. Films Film theater and project created solely for the online space, both live or pre filmed. There were hybrid formats online and on site. There was live on site theater combined with online spaces or spaces elsewhere in the world through digital tools and others websites, audio plays, shop windows, Instagram theater, and so on. We have some, some interesting examples already in these previous presentations. So I found that immediacy through direct play, live and close, crossing borders, feeling of being the only man spectators, being able to call in, being able to determine the order of a story being told, being able to explore the space by yourself, etc., are also possible online. The digital space is accessible for everyone worldwide. A reach and ex exchange and diversity are higher. Interplay with the real space is possible, so digital spaces could not so much replace analog worlds but expand them. And a dehierarchization of theater structures and working in my environments, for example, through the possibility to create and publish design spaces on your own are possible, or for example, as Aziza already showed us, can be used for political activism. Still, there's the problem of the lack of co-presence for the online stage design. Maybe we should find a new term for underlining the focus on the spectator experience that I see in many of my examples. The more digitally we live, interact, and experience space and communication with each other, the more important it becomes that there is feedback from the audience, that communication does not go lost unresponded. This is one of the phenomena that I noticed and where I would like to dig deeper. So I would, this is, um, this is it, <laughs> this is the end of my presentation. I would like be pleased to receive know-how about uh, this and related topics or references to text and projects that might be interesting to me. Thank you. Thank you, Thea. Thank you. We have two more speakers. Uh, and next one is Tamara Figueroa. Hello, everyone. You Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm Tamara Figueroa Ace, I'm a scenic designer, and I'm talking about uh, from Valparaiso, Chile. Uh, it's a great pleasure to me be here um, with you all, of course, um, from the southernest country of our beautiful planet. Um, and on behalf of the Chilean community of state designers and technicians, I greet you affectionately. It must be very nice to be together again in Prague. <laughs> um, I can share my presentation now. Okay. Um, my five minute shows and tell presentation uh, have the title to a side definition for performance design. Where are we? Uh, inside outside the theatrical stage, within a hybridity of space form. In so many occasions, we are outside the forms of drama. And currently, we are between the medial arts, but at this point is for the talk because I have only five minutes. 
what we know about sites. Um, site as a place defined as a particular and significant form of notion space. Site as a situation, if one accepts the proportion that the meaning and utterance action, actions events and affected by their local positions, but the situation of which they are a part of their work of R2 will be defined in relation to its place and position. Site are located situation, reflecting the notion semiotic theory proposes straightforwardly that reading implies location, to redesign to have located the signifier to have recognized its place within the semiotic system. One can go on on from this earlier location in reading of an image, object, or even in position in relation to political, aesthetic, geographical, institutional, or other discourses, all inform what it can be said to be. And for site specificity as a process, while as a site specific word might articulate and define itself through property, qualities, and many producing in specific relations relationships between an object or event and positioning it's occupied. This definition of Omnike. It's a site, I have a question now. It, it's, it's a site a specific necessary as site to perform? I, I, I don't think so a lot because site specific art, it's not necessarily a site to perform there, not always I mean. So um, on this opportunity, I would like uh, to share with you three works developed in Valparaiso in 2020 and 2021 during the Chilean political revolt and the pandemic. Ah, sorry. Palo Mario, actually it's, it's, in, it's in a word in Spanish either. It's, um, I dare to interpret the dramatist to, uh, to share with you the, the poetical pit notes, pigeonary, something like that. And the, first, and, and, and the first issue about uh, this work is we premiered this play when the theater were closed due to political revolt three months before the pandemic. The aesthetic proposal of this work has a political origin of resistance and political insistence. Of theme was dead, and the side was the city graveyard. The second word play is Techo, Roof, by Paraiso 2021, with the Theatrical Creation Laboratory of Valparaiso. And actually, we work uh, in, in this factory. It was a mass kind of train, and it's abandoned, and that we, it's occupied about uh, with us. Um, it's our space work now. And the second issue of, of this presentation is protest. And it was an intervention carried out of the peak of the pandemic, and it was the first walk to be exhibited to a mass public. We had 10 meters of distance between the stage and the audience, and 100 policemen controlling our actions. We can share the intimacy and the distance and uh, with us uh, as a scale problem now. And the third work, it's Brote, Albert. Community. Brote was conceived as an eco-feminist eco visual weapon, and it was premiered to the HM in Plaza Sotomayor, which is really a military square. It was the third massive concentration after the lockdown. On the first axis of this short presentation, um, I have a preliminary reflection of this space talks. So I think important to share the ideas in everything inside response to different ideological process now. One, create place with expanded treatment of the space. Two, create place with emphasis in telling with our audiences. 
and create place with the value paid of the performance design as a category, as, as a category by its own for the screen exercise too. Greetings for the technical team. Thank you very much, Tamara. Thanks. And the last speaker in this session, Tavet Janssen. Hello. I hope that my background noise won't, is not too loud that I, I can see a feedback of my voice. Uh, I sh now I share my screen. <coughs> and uh, greetings from Tallinn. I want to talk about electron art and uh, me myself. I'm a PhD student in Estonian Academy of Art working mainly on the topic of feeling of a presence and audience engagement in online virtual performing art situation. Electron is a digital venue where artists are working on the concept of a mediated performative event. Electron is created for performing arts, designed by artists, built by enthusiasts and funded by the Minister of Culture. Today I want to present our current position and the questions we have in, the, in this post-pandemic world. I tried to give some insight how we are approaching the audience research aspect in context of digital performance. Since 2020, we have been investing a lot of resources to investigate um, this online live performance paradigm, like we all, I guess. In one hand, We've been developing a technical and conceptual aspects of our platform to create a future venue. And on the second hand, we've been trying to create the new possibilities for audience engagement, the new ways for interaction and audience studies, also to contribute to audience studies. We've been hosting more than 100 performances and tens of thousands of audience during those two, last two years. And the last couple of years, when most of the audience events were held online, we found ourselves puzzling about how to make the audience in online events feel in the same way how they used to feel in live events, in the theater performances and live concerts, and started to think, will this be even possible? One bottleneck is that we haven't been able to crack how to get information from the audience about how we feel during the show. The only quantifiable data we had so far is audiences comings and goings to our homepage. So we, we started to think about what kind of methods we could apply to gather more information from the audience in real time. We started a project called Online Theatre as a research tool together with the University of Tartu Neuroscience Lab to find out to, uh, how to collect and visualize, visualize data from the audience during the live event. The main problems we are focusing on with our research are the spectators cannot express their thoughts and feelings during the show. Second, the organizers and artists don't know how their audience felt during the show. And third, this is a bit abstract, but I believe that visualization of the audience's reactions or feelings could help to create a community feeling among the audience. I talk about it later. We'll talk about it later. At first, we experiment, experimented with a basic emotion and assessment of our audience based on their webcam feed. We realized that emotion detection is not a trustworthy solution in that context. We decided to develop a tool where the spectator could consciously assess their experience while experiencing the show. So we at the moment, we are working uh, uh, with a slider that the audience can... We propose a framework or a question the specter can answer using the slider. We are not asking, do you like it? We ask them uh, to track their focus or assess their presence in the current moment. And interaction is recorded with, uh, with timestamp. After the event, the software visualizer visualizes everybody's reaction synced with a live event recording. So the software visualizes audiences' reactions synced with the video, 
and the authors, organizers can scroll through the whole event and see how the audience reacted in every moment and what happened in the event and in the same time. Uh, we, uh, uh, we have to think also, it is even more less. We have to think also about how to interpret the collected, the collect, collected data. We would, it would be too easy to mark the points where the audience reactions uh, were at maximum and conclude that those were the show's highlights. We think it's more complex than that. Our background in theater making should give us more ideas how, how about why the audience felt in the way they did. I believe an artistic mind would really contribute to this spectrum. And I see my time is up. Just, to, just to, for the coolness I want to add, you know, and, uh, like, uh, and we see it, uh, uh, even if we're focusing on live theater performance, we can see that it's, it can have much broader use cases later. Interaction with metaverse, quantifiable interaction metrics for web column applications, and so on. And uh, even we could use this data to train AI uh, in the, the future digital venues. I think I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Thavat. Thank you. So these were our wonderful presenters in this session, and now we have some time for Q&A. Okay, thank you very much, Bara. And I would like to ask Maria, Marina, and Sarah if they could come uh, onto the stage while we also have all our online presenters on there. We have time for, for questions. Uh, so do we have any questions? And I think Adam is there with, with a microphone. So questions to any or all, all of our speakers on the, or the, on the panel. Mm -hmm. If I may then, I'll just kickstart the discussion. Uh, and I'll probably start with, uh, with something that Tavit mentioned in the last presentation, connecting to audiences. Many of the presentations were reflecting how we are affected, why we have, how we have, we have been affected by COVID, things that we aspire to, connecting to people. Not all of them are here in front of us. So how do we engage audiences? Do we engage them through brains or how do we rediscover the muscular, the muscles, the bodies in space? So my question to everyone on the panel is how do you, what, where are we as audiences with our bodies, with our muscles in time? How are we in time in your projects? Thank you. Um, I was just like really thrilled to see all these different projects because I feel like everyone has a different answer to that because you have to make a choice. And I feel like in our case, we really wanted to attend to the people at home, which is why we wanted to give them some physical artifacts to interact with so that it, um, because we weren't going to be sharing space, we couldn't get feedback. You know, we had explored like, will it be live? Will it not be live? And it was a way, you know, to not replicate, but to care for the time that they are spending with the piece. Also knowing that people's attention is very different for an online performance at home than one that they can go to the theater and see. So to give them the freedom to um, explore at their own pace is my answer to that. Just uh, um, the fact or the point I was trying to make with the video that was never shown is exactly I think the answer to your question, I think the key now at, and where we are now is that we need to care for the needs and respect. It sounds so simple and going back to the essentials, but that's what happens. That's what happened with each and every one of the example in a different manner. You care for their needs, their wants, our needs, our wants, and the coexistence. And if respect comes into that as the, the primal uh, driving force, then I think it happens and the communication, the theater communication happens. Thank you, Marina. Maria? So um, for, for, for the project I was sort of uh, presenting, I think 
the technology was not um, a, it was a catalyst, a very interesting catalyst, but it was it wasn't the, the starting point. So they actually also started you uh, using a Zoom as a rehearsal platform, like I, I heard with other projects. And, and then they slowly were um, trying to incorporate this uh, as a production and performance platform. So there, there, was a, a, there was a lot of weight on the experiential um, aspect of uh, uh, joining both the, the artists and the audience. So there was a, a very um, a focal um, uh, aspect of the, the current experience, what was going on. They had a project about uh, uh, female uh, violence on, on women, on uh, uh, female oppression and all that. And this sort of clicked together with the momentum of the COVID and, and the, the oppression and restriction that all, all uh, audience felt uh, regardless of gender. And then also um, with the momentum, as I said, the Me Too, the Greek Me Too movement uh, that was catching up. So I think uh, because I, I, was, I was very um, pleasantly surprised to see that we, we're, we're more and more, you know, uh, moving towards the technological aspect, but also merging it with the physical. I think I think that the, the physical experience and the community, um, uh, you know, um, all the questions the community brings. Uh, we're going to use technology, but but I think the experiential and the, and the shared, you know, um, uh, questions are the basis for for our communication. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Would any of our online presenters like to respond? to how we engage with audiences, what kind of experience we hope for, how we engage them, not only mentally, intellectually, imaginatively, but also physically. Um, I'll jump in with like a, a kind of, just a kind of, a kind of comment in response to that. I'm interested in this idea that actually when we're in, like our physical bodies in a physical theater space there are so many um rules as to how we behave and how we're expected to feel i, I remember seeing a show in person actually it was short it was back in 2019 so like not long before 2020 um obviously and the performer opened with this like big statement of oh god i hope there's no one pregnant in the audience and at the time i was pregnant and then there was no way for me to escape like i was in the middle of the theater row um and our show that we did with um caroline's production all of me that we put online we were aware of the subject matter and that taking care of people and we had a lot of messages in the before the twine starts, there are warnings that come up. There are links to kind of different places you can go to for help. There's warnings of subject matter. And there's the option saying, would you like to continue? And that option saying, actually, no, maybe this isn't for me that you can click on and then you're instantly out of the twine. And so I think that digital world that if people are experiencing it from home, allowing them that freedom to escape if they need to, to shut down, to not engage and making it really clear that that's an option that that kind of even though I in my presentation I was talking about wanting the audience to feel not safe even though they're in control of the mouse and how we're playing with that balance of the glitch but making it clear that there's always that freedom to depart the space if necessary which maybe allows you to kind of engage more or to kind of put like that interesting balance of the boundaries you can push in a digital space if you make it very clear to the audience that they can leave whenever they want that that's up to them yeah, I just think there's something quite interesting in that balance without really finishing the point I'm making. Yeah, thank you. Th yeah, thank you, Eleanor. Any other responses, comments, questions? I, 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 it. I think that maybe we over mystify the feeling of uh, being present physically in the same space. Maybe it's not so important. And then maybe there are ways how we can, you know, to have it's not so binary. It's it's not that we are in physical space and this is good and we are behind our computer and this is bad. I think there is a like gray scale. And also when in audience uh, engagement, there is a gray scale, like where we want them to be. I think this is, is a maximum. I'm like a, with my picture, with my mic on, I'm kind of here present. Even though if I'm 
I, I totally messed up with uh, times when this event starts. So actually, I'm in a marketplace with uh, with other people around. And uh, but somehow I can choose where I want to be physically. And uh, I started to, you know, uh, to think of it as uh, more important than it was before 2020. So I can choose myself where I want to be, with who I want to be, getting this experience. Think, think, yes, please. Yeah. Um, it it comes back to another thing that wasn't mentioned, and in terms of where are we, I think we need new terminology as well, the language, because we have all these different types of performance exchange, physical, not physical, live performances going hybrid, not hybrid going, and it seems that it it we are at a turning point of where we need to new a new language and new terminologies in order to describe all these amazing projects that are happening and differentiate between what they are so that the audience's expectations are the right ones when they come join us. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions from the audience? Yeah, there is a question over there at the back. I will run with a, with the microphone. No. Hello. Okay. Uh, those are great presentations. Um, I think I have a fairly simple question, more so directed at Aziza and Eleanor in one clean sweep, hopefully. Um, is to do with the interesting decolonial digital space that Aziza, you were talking about, especially to do with the sort of current Russian uh, siege against Ukraine and how in a way it seems like you're, you're dealing with a territory of glitch, which ties into Elena and what she's doing to subvert uh, the suppression within that digital realm. And I, I wanted you to sort of delve into that, which, yeah, both of you maybe might touch on in a bit of detail, but thank you for the presentation. Thank you. I, 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 my internet acted up again a little bit, so I didn't hear a part of the question, but I'll try to answer it. Also answering the previous one as well, because um, to me, uh, it's, it's becoming less and less about spectatorship and more and more about giving agency to the audience that is interacting with the projects that we do. And our projects are not really performances anymore. They're tools for people to actually use um, to create their own narratives. And um, in, in regards of the growing uh, sort of oppression, including, you know, um, no more free speech in Russia and also you know, I'm currently in Uzbekistan, which is my home country, which is also to an extent uh, a police state that doesn't have much free speech. Um, it is important to find um, spaces that, you know, the bureaucratic systems have not really discovered yet. And augmented reality is one of those spaces. Um, so uh, we really, so I'm sort of working with a lot of decolonial artists and decolonial feminists in particular, because we'll also look at this intersection between, you know, um, not just oppression in terms of colonial, you know, uh, relationships, but also patriarchy and the women in Uzbekistan and Russia, and then also the relationship inside, um, uh, like, you know, merging different ethnicities and uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to put things into words, but they don't, it doesn't really work. Um, so we are trying to give this tool to the people who don't really have voices in the institutions that are normally, you know, dominant in the cultural field. And um, so far it's been giving really interesting results because, um, for instance, in Russia and also in, well, in Russia, you could see there was a um, um, feminist anti-war initiative that is mostly online on social media and also using augmented reality. Um, and then in Uzbekistan, women, young women started becoming more sort of vocal in what they're doing also through social media and social media AR. So yeah, I don't really know what else to say. 
I'm just saying that we're all in this, just figuring it out and there aren't any answers because AR is just quite a new thing. Um, and just hopefully we can find ways to express whatever we're living through right now uh, and, and show the world that, you know, the, the post-Soviet space is not as black and white as it seems. Um, and yeah, shall I jump in there? Is that an okay space for me to jump in, Aziza? Um, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Because, yeah, continuing on from that kind of final comment, my my kind of wider research that I'm hoping to explore in my PhD, which I'm only a few months in, so I feel really early days, and I've got this voice in my head saying, you're not qualified to comment right now, but I'm just going to try and ignore that voice. Um, my I'm excited about the possibilities that glitch and mess, in particular mess in the creative making process, what that offers in terms of a way of breaking down binaries and breaking down the rules by which we currently engage with art, with space, with theatre making, with hierarchies within kind of a making structure um, and kind of what, how, yeah, what kind of allowing for mess, allowing for mistake and seeing the kind of potential in those moments allow. I'm really interested in, and this is a slight sidestep, but how the glitch is something that's jumped on by conspiracy theorists as like the thing that reveals the truth, like glitching in photos that proves that someone's a, actually a lizard. Um, and that's 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 a, bon a bonkers. I'm I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and conspiracy theories are incredibly dangerous in the, our kind of currently world world political atmosphere. But I think there's something in that that um, can spark new creativity that allows us to see beyond what is already there, but in a lovely, positive, creative way, not like a dangerous, pushing, awful, like misinformation way. Um, but I think there's a, a romanticism to kind of what that what that kind of that idea, like there's a kind of creativity there. But yeah, I'm really excited about what mess and glitching offers as a way of snapping us out of our, our kind of current rules and the way we do things without thinking. So like um, just any moment that makes us pause and reassess what we're doing and how we can do it differently. And, and if we're falling into comfortable ruts that shut people out or shut down new creative ways of working, that's where glitching and mess kind of really excite me. I hope that's, well, that's kind of a a useful kind of response to your kind of brilliant comment. Thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, I'm aware of time, uh, so I would like to thank all our on-site and online speakers. Uh, for raising a lot of questions on where we are and how we use this change and shock in our worlds to imagine something better, something more equitable. Uh, I assure all, your, all our friends online that there are also joys on site, such as food, and it's incredible for an audience to be fed with their body as well as their minds. So we'll have a lunch break, whatever time zone you are on. Uh, thank you very much for coming. I would like also to thank our technical team because this was a concert. Okay. And we, we all deserve a lunch and the higher powers are telling me, Misha and Adam are telling me that we have 60 minutes. So we will be starting again at half past two, 2.30, okay? So 2.30, be fed, be happy and be glad that we are here. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank really you. lovely, really lovely to meet you all. I'm going to try and find you all on Instagram and Twitter. Yes, yes, please do. Uh, it was very short. Yeah. <laughs> we'll meet the next year, no? Yes, yes of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Amazing yeah. presentations, everyone. It was yeah. just the I yeah. enjoy that. amazing group of people to be with. So, yeah. <laughs> lovely. Well, I hope to run into you next year. Yeah, I will yes. I'll look out for you all on social media and see you all next year in person. Lovely. Okay, right. bye. 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 Bye.